Today's guest made the transition from animation to live action, and he's gonna tell us all about it. Howdy, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the host of the Q&A, and my agenda is simple. Each week I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. So today on our Zoomcast podcast, we interview director Dave Wilson about his feature debut, Bloodshot. And you know, we're doing Zoomcast podcast now, so you could find it on YouTube, on Backstory Magazine's YouTube page that is newly launched if you wanna see us chat, or of course it'll always still be here in the regular podcast feed as well. But I just want you to know that both were available because that's the way we're doing it now. And you know, historically, Bloodshot's gonna always be looked at as an interesting film because it was one of the releases that was going into theaters as many states were starting to lock down in the nation and actually became one of the movies that transitioned from theaters to VOD and did quite well on VOD. So if you're looking for something interesting to watch, I hope you will support Dave's film and go check it out on VOD today uh, to show your support. And speaking of support, while you're online moving around, why not go to Backstory.net as well? Um, we are updating our Oscar issue, issue 41, with new articles. We've done TV shows like Devs, Better Call Saul, Upload, Tales from the Loop on Amazon. And so there's a lot of new content that we're continuing to put in and update issue 41, but we are beginning on issue 42 because it is our eighth year, Backstory launched in 2012, and we're gonna be publishing our issue 42, our newest issue, and it's gonna have great stuff, but now more than ever, we could definitely use your support. So if you've ever thought about reading Backstory, I do hope you'll go check us out so that you can support the great entertainment journalists editors and our amazing art director so that we could keep doing what we're doing so you could find it all at backstory.net and you could even test drive us by reading the free issue over there as well but now without any further ado let's jump right into our zoomcast podcast with director dave wilson to chat about his feature debut bloodshot i'm good jeff how are you <laughs> good you sound tired man i know you've been pulling a lot of late nights lately right uh yes i've been uh, between sort of homeschooling and uh, and development it's just not left a lot of time for for sleep but uh but it's but it's good i think it's just you know i think we're under the circumstances i think we're we're doing well it's it's a little crazy out there well sleep is for cowards so you're you're, <laughs> you're good you're good well so i, I want to give people a baseline you're you're from south laugh you're, you're from south africa mm -hmm. and you you came here to good old los angeles what year did you come here? What what year did you decide to make that big jump? I came here in I think two thousand and three. Okay. Uh, Tim Miller, who who uh, uh, runs Blur, uh, brought me out. I was I was doing animation back then um, in South Africa, and I knew some of the. It was a very small industry back then, so and most of it was sort of. It was a, a small and closely knit sort of online community of, of sort of 3D generalists. And, uh, and I knew some of them and then there were some folks at Blur and I sort of, you know, got to know them. And then, and then Tim sort of, I started talking to him in like 2001, 2002. And then like he decided to bring me out in 2003. And then I spent 15 years with that man. <laughs> 15 years of Blur Studios. Yes. And you know it's interesting because as an animation, as an as an animation director, as an animator, you have a lot of control of your frame. And obviously, yeah. we're going to be talking about your feature film debut for mm -hmm. Bloodshot today. What what were some of the things that your animation training gave you that really kind of helped when you were jumping into the fray for Bloodshot? You know, there's just sort of pre-production and post are almost identical when it comes to like that anim animation versus live action. You know, the, the storyboarding is the same, the previs is the same, the prep is the same, the and the and the post side, the editing, visual effects, isn't really no not much difference there. Obviously, like the filming process of it is is wildly different. Um, but but you hit the nail on the head in terms of how much you you can control in in animation. It in one sense, I've, I've always referred to animation as sort of directing in slow motion. In other words, you give a note and then sort of two weeks later, it manifests itself into, into what you ask for. Sometimes it's what you ask for and other times it's not. And then you sort of go again. Um, so like you wield a sort of awesome control over, over animation just because of how, um, how sort of broken down the process is. I mean, like you can, 
control an eyebrow if you wanted to, which I don't think any actor is going to want that level of, uh, no. of, sort of manipulation. Um, but I think the biggest thing that I noticed that was sort of, uh, it was a little unprepared for um, was when you're, you know, I, one of the things is, as a, as a first time filmmaker, when you're sort of meet, talking to studios and, and you want to make a movie, like the, the first question they all ask you is like, can you work with actors? Um, which I find an, an odd question uh, in of itself, but, you know, at Blur, a lot of the work we did, especially and Blur was one of the sort of pioneers of, of, of motion capture, like where a lot of studios were and still stick to keyframe um, animation. Like we, 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 we did a lot of motion capture work. And you were um, doing it for video games too, basically. You were doing like the yeah, movies no, I mean, that would play between levels in video games. Somewhat, yes. Mostly we ended up doing um, basically commercials. They were long format commercials, like three, five... That, like I did these huge ones for the Elder Scrolls that ended up being like 25 minutes of commercials. And the first one was six and the second one was eight minutes long. And the third commercial was like 10 minutes long. Wow. Um, uh, so they were really just commercials. Like we were, you know, um, with the early on in the sort of early days of, of, of gaming where like the graphic fidelity was too low to be able to tell a story cinematically. Yes, like back then, Blur was doing like interstitial animation to sort of move a story along. But as sort of, you know, graphics got better and the fidelity got better and you could just tell the story within the edge and our sort of that po portion of the market kind of dried up. I mean, I, it, because it was, it's sort of, if you're playing like The Last of Us to sort of, come away from it and show like a pre-rendered cutscene. it almost removes you from the narrative experience. And so right. if the engine's quality is enough to keep you immersed in it, like why pull you out of it? So it, it just are, took years to, it took years to get there. Yeah, like, exactly. Like, it, um, um, so we were, you know, uh, we found ourselves doing cinematics mostly for like MMOs or real time strategy games where the engines couldn't compete with like the visuals that we were, that, that we were creating. Um, I've gone off a wild tangent and, and lost the quick thread here. Um, but, oh, actors, yes. So we were doing a lot of motion capture. And uh, and I always found um, motion capture more challenging in the in the aspect of, I mean, you, you have an actor in a in a feeling extraordinarily vulnerable in a, in a skin-tight black leotard in a white padded room. And, like, there's nothing around them. Like, there's no right. set, there's no wardrobe, there's nothing. And... And you have to fill it all in for them. So it's far more sort of theater in the realm than it is like a movie set. So to that degree, it's, it's motion capture is more challenging um, from a directorial standpoint. But because you're on this white padded room and there, uh, uh, and there are, um, hang on one sec. I'm just going to mute that. And that, um, because there are, you know the because there is there's there's no, there's no sets there's no extras there's no wardrobe there's no there's barely props there's nothing to really have to reset for you know what i mean you're just sort of sitting there and you can focus entirely on the performance of your actor you don't have to um you know you don't have to worry about like the reset time or anything like that so you get like you can get 25 30 takes you know quickly Versus on a on a live action set, you know, you've got six or seven because every time you got to reset your extras and your lights and your DP wants to run in there and fix something, and it's really so that part of the process was sort of a little sort of awakening to me in terms of how much you're actually able, how much time you have to focus on on just raw performance. You know, it's interesting because oh, you 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 got to sorry, go on. What were you going to say? No, 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 I, I, I had muted the, this thing then, but now I can do Okay. It. Well, well, you know, you got to sit there as Tim made his feature debut with Deadpool. Right. And, and obviously being able to do that and, and the reputation of Blur led to you getting Bloodshot. What was kind of one of the biggest lessons you learned by observing Tim with Deadpool? And then we'll get fully into Bloodshot. You know, uh, what's interesting about you know, the process of Tim making, of, of making Deadpool. Yes, definitely there was a uh, sort of the actual process of that film in particular, but it was more the, 
the studio itself that I felt prepared both Tim for Deadpool and me for my film in that that's the, the other, like, I don't, I think what you probably don't like or can't really learn in film school until you're on it on, not that I have any basis for comparison of what that would be like, but what I imagine you can't sort of experience to the degree of a film at that, at that scale is the amount of people you are leaning on to help get your story across. And every day at Blur, we have 150 artists that we are leveraging their talents and their abilities to tell sort of a story. And I think that's the part of the process that not just Deadpool, but like Blur in of itself was the best preparation for, um, for the film and how to, how to get the best out of everybody every day. I mean, it is, you know, a lot of people ask, ask you like, what was the most challenging part of, of, the, of the film? And many things like is the short answer. But one of the things that like I found incredibly terrifying was I'd spent 15 years in the same sort of space with the same people. Like, you know, I have my DP, it's just a, a digital DP, and I have my set designer and all these folks, but they're, and in the space of two months, I said goodbye to all of them, found a whole bunch of new people and, decided, and went off on like the sort of my largest creative endeavor to date. And that to, that to me was, was, you know, you don't know who you're gonna get along with and you take your best guess and who's gonna sort of understand like what you're trying to achieve creatively. So that was terrifying, and and some of it worked, and some of it didn't. Um, but that you know, the, the team that you surround yourself with, and the artists, I feel like the the process of you know, because Tim and I were the creative directors, so it wasn't just Deadpool. I think it was all the years of of leveraging the talents of the artists around us. Um, that I think was the best preparation as far as you know, Deadpool itself goes. You know, there were certainly lessons of of uh you know the politics of movie making that we like that i observed closely and tried to apply as best i could to my experience was there anything you want to tell us about a kind of tense political situation without using names that was a good lesson for you you know i just think um there's a lot of psychology that goes into the process of it just because we're all very sort of emotionally and passionately invested in these things. So to, it's difficult. It's a balance between, you know, forcibly or manipulate in a very sort of manipulative manner of getting what you want. And on the other hand, like, you know, not making people feel like they're just being manipulated or forced into doing something they don't want to do that, you know, um, it's just a, like, you can't ignore the fact that everyone is there um, wanting to, to contribute and and I think the minute you try and remove that part of the process from someone who is integrate you know uh, intimately involved in it with you I think it gets difficult and you need to be enough on the plate for people to feel you know valuable to the contribution and I think and the other thing is like you just also have to remember like whether you like it or not like there is a totem pole and your position on it needs to be known to yourself because it can, you know, like, it's just the nature of the business, unfortunately. That's a, that's a very politically based answer. I, I like it. I like it. Um, um, look, I would just say, like, that there's no, like, it's in all the trades and, like, you know, that him and Ryan didn't didn't sort of end, you know, it didn't sort of work out as well as they wanted it to. And I, I, I'm not, but, like, I can't, I've never had a conversation with Ryan, so I can't tell you his side of the story. But, I like, I know that there is a lot of, um, uh, um, everyone, you know, they, we're all risking a lot going out there. It's no, a, of course, of course. And uh, and I think, I think people want to make sure that, like, it's, I, you know, I think they all just want to make sure that they are are being heard. And I'm, you know, uh, I think there was, it's just as long. I think, yeah, it's one people. Want we won't to, spend more. We won't spend more on Deadpool. Yeah, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna step in a landmine. It's gonna blow. Yes, up. yes, yes. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Well, I mean, look, it was it was a really good movie. You could tell it was passionate. Everybody had fun, and yeah, things didn't work out to get the same team exactly back for the second. But tell us about about Bloodshot. I know it's the most boring question, but really briefly, just what attracted you to the material, and how did you get attached as a director? Because it, getting attached as a director to something. For a first time feature film is is a big moment in a director's life. So mm -hmm. put us in the room and let us know when you the day you realized that you were gonna basically be greenlit to direct bloodshot and take it from there. 
You know, it's a long, so first of all, I always, you know, before I even got into animation, so I'm going to go all the way back to South Africa. Go, go, go. The answer to this question is going to start. Um, I always wanted to tell stories. It wasn't necessarily like filmed entertainment. And like, I love my authors specific, like, um, uh, are my rock stars and I wanted to write. And then it was too sort of solitary a profession and, and too daunting. So I, uh, and I loved visuals a lot. So I, and, and gaming and all of that, and it is sort of like visual effects laden films, especially with like that, like when, when Jurassic Park came out and then like a year later or two years later, Toy Story came out, that world was fascinating to me. But in like the nineties in South Africa, it's not really something that there's a sort of career path for. I, I think my guidance counselor in college just didn't even know what I was talking about. Um, and then, so I, so I started like sort of investing my time in animation because I like some Neil Blomkamp animated films I found. And then I sort of uh, found myself and then t sort of Tim brought me out and, uh, and, and I spent all, all my time with him at Blur. But I always wanted to do what I was doing. And I never, it wasn't animation because um, like, you know, the, like that that's, was the end game for me. It was just at the time, that's how I could tell stories. Like not a lot of people saw, everyone knows Neil, like obviously Neil for the movies he's made and like the Alive and Joburg short he did. But prior to that, he was doing these full animated like robot rebellion shorts that I don't know if anyone ever saw. Charlotte Copley showed them to me. That's how I sort of fell into animation because he was just making them by himself. And I was like, this is awesome. I can just tell stories by myself. I don't need a crew or film equipment or anything like that, which I didn't have money for. So I was like, I'll do it. I'll tell my stories this way. Um, and then when I got to Blur, you know, I remember if, like I'd been there about six or seven years and I said to Tim, like, why aren't we, like, I want more live action. We should do, be, be doing more live action. I remember the time it was like, what do you want to do that for? Like Fincher says we're wasting our time and animations. So I'm like, it was, it was, it was sort of a, again, I think it was because of the amount of control you wield over animation that we wanted to stay there. But some of the stories I wanted to tell weren't suited for, for, for animation. And that was always like the, whether it was animation or live action, I feel like the medium needs to fit the story um, appropriately. And then, so then, you know, so I had started down the sort of path of wanting to, there is just like a slew of meetings and generals that you have to sort of to get to know everybody in, in the business. And I'd started all of that process. I think there were a few, there were a few Star Wars. I did some Star Wars like sort of commercials that like piqued some attention and folks wanted to meet and talk about, uh, you know, um, if I had sort of feature film aspirations, which I did. Um, but it's a long process, like I said, especially coming from, you know, animation with the question of like, well, can, can you deal with actors? And then as the sort of business started to move more towards like motion capture and then performance capture, and then we were working with those actors, but just on like, it started, the sort of two worlds started to become a little closer together. Um, while they were sort of seemingly one was animated and one was live action, the lines were blurring as, as the sort of the, the fidelity of what was being created sort of got better and better. Um, and then, you know, and Tim had been wanting to, you know, he'd been trying to get Deadpool made, I think since like 2009 or like a long, long time, 2010. And then obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not like, my ego's not going to get in the way of it. Like when your friend has that much success, like there's a giant big spotlight on, on, on blur in general. And, you know, so people go like, well, who else is over there? I, I, for the longest time, I felt like my poster was going to say, from the guy who sat next to the guy who directed Deadpool, because there is like, whether you want to admit it or not, there's this giant validation system that in, that exists in Hollywood because it can often be like a very risk averse bunch and they need to convince people like why this is like a, you know, a, uh, something that will work. Um, but look, don't get me wrong. Like there is, at some point all that will dissipate and you're going to be sitting in a room with the, the heads of the studio and it is your your 15 minutes to tell them why they should make the movie. And and that's where I say like there is a lot of blur that helps with that moment. Like there is, um, you know, Tim and I would endlessly have to pitch like for these million dollar commercials. And, and these people control some of the biggest IPs in the world from Halo to Star Wars. 
and we have to, you know, uh, very eloquently and passionately explain to them like what we're going to do with their, with their money and our vision and everything like that. And then for them to feel comfortable being like, okay, we're going to hand this all over to you. And a, you know, and then a feature film is, you know, 10 times that. Um, but I'm like that process of, of sort of indoctrinating someone with the vision for your film is something that I'm intimately familiar with and actually love. I, I, uh, I remember having dinner with Chris Anderson. He used to edit Wired magazine. This is a long story. Like, uh, uh, and Chris and I were having this conversation about venture capitalism and and the and the similarities between that and filmmaking. Where at some point you're going to be standing on the coffee table with like a confidence you don't deserve to have to sell a product you don't know anybody's going to buy. But if you don't stand up there and you don't beat your chest and you don't sell it like no one's gonna give you anything like and and that's the truth whether you want to sort of say it's an art form and and you know we shouldn't have to do that like fine they're absolutely your prerogative to do it that way but these movies cost you know tens to hundreds of millions of dollars to make so i don't blame people for wanting to know what they're buying you know um and so you know so Sorry. when i pitched like my like I take a lot of pride in, in how I pitch and I put together what I consider a pretty compelling package. I, I won't give all the details, but I remember when I pitched to Tom Rothman and at the end of my little 20 minute pitch, he was like, okay, now it's my turn to talk. And I thought this was where I was going to get like told how I didn't belong in this room. And he was incredibly complimentary. Like not so many words, like, you know, it was like, that's one of the most impressive pitches for a film I've ever seen. Like, which was which was nice, you know, like because you always feel like you're going to get to the room where you don't belong at some point. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just just for our listeners out there, like years ago when right after we first met, you showed me an art book that you had put together for a film that you still hope to make one day. Yes, and yeah. it was it was absolutely you know gorgeous. It was like a proof of concept with these amazing storyboards, a great sense of who the characters were. It wasn't focused so much on the story to my memory so much as the world. So it was almost it was almost like a lookbook. So I think that's another benefit that you had. And so in that room with Tom Rothman for 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 Bloodshot, was was there just a moment where he's like, okay, you're you're gonna direct this, and you know you didn't have to do a screen test or short a, shoot a short scene or anything silly like that. No, I mean, and look, that definitely does happen. I feel like those are usually most valuable when there's a sort of tonal element that people can't quite wrap their head around. Like what I thought was you know, I think with, with Deadpool, for example, with the leak footage, I, I think it was finally people could kind of go like, oh, I get it. I get where the sort of irreverent tone of the superhero sort of space exists. It's funny, like, it's like uh, Tom was at Fox when Tim took Deadpool there. Tom was it's like, you know. Yeah. So, like, uh, I remember, the, I think the last thing he said to me as he was sort of left the pitch room was like, don't believe everything Tim tells you about me. Um, it's funny. Uh well, that, well, that's that's cool. So you got you got bloodshot, and, and but I would say to to answer your question about like did they say off you know like that's it you're off to the races, sort of yes and no. There isn't re like very rarely is there like this watershed moment where it goes from nothing to everything, right? right. Um, it's usually a, a a sort of video game level of like climbing the ladder as you conquer one after the other. Um, and ultimately, like, look, there are somewhere, somewhere, there is a, a bunch of people in a room sort of figuring out the equation of the business side of things. Um, and, and, you know, like, I feel like with um, the last piece of the puzzle was obviously Vin. Like, once he dropped in, I think it was all off to the races. But as far as, like, the film we were making, like, the story and, and what it was going to be and what I was telling them, yes, everyone was on board with that. Um, and now it was just a matter of finding our cast. All right, I want to I want to dip into the spoilers as fast as I can because I know we're okay. running out of time. So just before I do, what was the budget and the schedule? What could you tell us about your budget and schedule? You know, to this day, I still don't know. Like, you know, <laughs> what our budget would you say was. it was under twenty or over twenty? Oh no, it's over twenty. Like, okay. I, like somewhere around fifty. I, uh, okay, more. You were, you were shooting in South Africa to get the tax credits as well. Uh, yes. Um, and also just because 
I'm so being from there, you know, and knowing the crews and folks that have been out there, the, the tax credits are one thing, but they really like we needed to build a lot. Like we built almost all of those sets. Uh, most of it is, is set work and very little of it is practical. It's a sort of nature of, of the movie star of, of, you know, where you can and can't take movie stars of that scale yeah. in, in that environment. So we, we had to build a lot and you can really, you can like economically, um, you can really do a lot there. However, that wouldn't be the, there are many places where you can build cheaply, but so, like, you can really build affordably there with great craftsmanship. There are good crews there that sort of cut their teeth on commercials in, in the nineties and then sort of like late two thousands, they started uh, sort of film and television started coming in there so that there are some really great people out there now. So yes. And what, and what would you say the schedule was? Uh, 55 days. Oh, wow. Like, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Um, all right, we're getting into the spoilers uh, because I've been, I've been waiting to ask you this for, for, uh, for a while. Yeah. We, we've discussed this a little before. The first part of your movie, and I say this kindly, absolutely sucks. And I mean it in the kindest way because it's a total cliche. And when I was watching it, I'm like, oh, no, Dave, what are you getting into? I'm like, please tell me there's more to this. But, of course, there is. It sucks on purpose because we're in the spoiler section, kids. So if you haven't seen Bloodshot press pause, go see it, come back, listen to the rest of the interview. Um, Cause you could see it on demand now. Um, but, but it's, it's all a part of a ruse story wise because you're doing it in a cliched gutso machismo fashion right. that right. this character would expect because he's been programmed to think it's like that because mm -hmm. people have, you know, for all general purposes taken over his mind in a sense and implanted these memories so that he could be an assassin that always thinks he's avenging something for his wife, for his wife's death. And mm -hmm. when in fact, as we find out later in the movie, she's not dead at all. And, and it's all a ruse. So my, my biggest question for you is that how long did you realize you were going to play that trick on the audience for? Cause it's a dangerous game. If you go oh, too yes. long, <laughs> if you go too long, they're going to walk out of the theater or press pause and just not come back. But at, at the same time, if you go too short, you're, you're really ruining something special too, too early. So how did, how did you decide how many minutes even that you were going to do it in that style, which, you know, evokes like nineties action movies and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I really liked it when the, when the curtain was, you know, peeled back as well. As far as how long it was, that was just sort of a process of, of, of the cutting room. There was definitely, I always wanted it to be the first part of, of, of the film and not sort of cut away from it. Um, it. The hard part is like I sit in the, <laughs> in the audience and I'm just like cringing myself in the, when we would focus this movie. I think one of the barometers for like, yes, I, I, I was waiting for people to walk out being like, oh my God, like, I remember one of the focus cards was there was some young woman who was like, Oh my God, I wanted to walk out of this movie so badly. And like, but then like, she was like, I was so happy to have my sort of my, uh, expectations, dashed. like my sensibilities validated, like, um, which was great. But at the same time, it's hard to sort of, um, to sort of sit there and, and stomach it to a degree. How long it was, was sort of dictated somewhat by, you know, by the, the, the script we were, we were telling. Um, but I, you know, there was, it was definitely fueled a lot by those sort of like, you know, like 80s and 90s action movies, it was always like, there's a whole like, you know, um, woman in refrigerators sort of thing about it where we sort of raped, maimed and murdered women for like, two decades in order to give male protagonists sort of a motivated like agenda. And I was like, well, if you were going to have a revenge machine, like why don't we just lean in? Like they would look at what successful films in the eighties and nineties sort of blend into. Let's just put that in his head. That seemed to work. Right. So it was meant to sort of evoke a lot of that same cinematic language. And like at the beginning of this podcast, you asked like sort of what were some of the challenges and difficulties there is so much as a filmmaker that you that gets left behind. I feel like when you just have to get what you need to get on the day, and like there was like you know it's it's a little I, I don't want to say I'm, I'm I'm unhappy about it. I'm I'm not. I'm I'm very proud. I'm very happy. However, like there was all sorts of 
things that I, you know, I, I would have preferred to have like a bigger disparity between those two cinematic languages so that you literally felt like, wait, what the fuck just happened to the movie I was watching 15, for the first 15 minutes, right? Um, uh, because they would have been wildly different. Like one would have been filmed in a virtual environment, right? And the other would have been completely, um, you know, uh, is, would have been, is the real story we're telling. So there was a lot like that I, I unfortunately didn't get to do there, but there was, how did we gauge how long we wanted that to be? I, I, we, it just sort of what felt right. And we weren't getting any walkouts in the test screening. So <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, you know, it's, what's an early idea that you had to discard something that you really wanted to do, but you couldn't afford, or you didn't have the time to shoot, but maybe for a couple of weeks in your process, you're like, Oh yeah, this is going to be a great sequence. Um, something that wasn't, there, shot, was, there, were a couple of, there, were, there were a couple of things. One is like, I forever like sort of cringe at the fact that we had us like more repetition, more, more groundhog day, more behind the curtain more seeing why some of the characters were frustrated with the repetition in the process. Like if you look at sort of edge of tomorrow, like when Cruz is going, like it's just such a fun part of the film, but it's also informative. And like, and we basically just didn't have the days to get that, um, to get that done. I, because I, I felt like when you get to see, when you, when you realize it's all manipulative and you, and you sort of get to, to flip the, the point of view and see what they see, to me, is the the best time to understand all the other characters. Unfortunately, it was just not something we could sort of make work in the days we have. And then I would say, on the other side of it, there were some fun, great little fun moments with like the tech Eric and some of the other techs, where they would comment on the dialogue in the first fifteen minutes. There was this little scene between them where one of the the female technicians is changing the dialogue. And, and, and he's like, wait, what, what the hell are you doing? And she's like, it's, it's 2020, man. Like he needs to sort of empathize with her and validate her emotions. And like, he's like, no, what the hell are you talking about? Like, just put it back the way it was. Like, so, because I, I, you know, there was always this fear that like people wouldn't understand, like, no, 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 I, I get that, that, you know, it's cheesy. It's meant to be. And it was a way for you to understand that, but it was also just fun. I would say by far the biggest thing regret I have is that we weren't able to sort of get a peek more behind the curtain and understand the other characters more. It was just a bit, you know. I, I thought Ray as a character, you know, showed a lot of vulnerability. So I could see Vin Diesel really being attracted to it. What, what were some of your more interesting discussions about kind of exploring the character with him? Because I know it's really important before you shoot. And of course, while you're shooting to do that, but it was, it was good to see him stretch and, you know, some, some kind of different territory here in which for as much machismo as there is in the beginning of the movie, you see how damaged he is as he actually unravels throughout the rest of the movie and kind of gives up his fears by the end when he just goes into a full attack on the people that did this to him. Right. It was definitely the, the very first conversation we had, like I had with him was at Blur. Um, and uh, it was all about that, like how sort of, uh, you know, Xander and Dom, these are sort of Riddick, uh, alf strong alpha male characters. But I think the, the common trait that they all have is they're always one step ahead of everybody else. Like just when you think it's all gone to shit, like they have a plan that is ahead of everyone else's. And I'm like, your character is the complete opposite in this film, like in the beginning, in the middle of, uh, in that you are, are trying to catch up with being manipulated and figure everything out. And I think that was appealing to him. Um, and I will say this a quick, uh, quick time, like, I don't know if we ever talked about this before, but his eight year old son was with him on the day we pitched him. It was the LA fires. And it was, I think part of the allure was his, his twin, like Ben's twin brother, who's his age and his eight year old son were both fans of the comic. Like, so there was this, I think that was very appealing to him too, how it sort of spanned like the, sort of generations but as a character yes i think um i think there was definitely an appeal of to uh to explore something that he doesn't usually sort of get to do with those other films hello i'm jumping in really quick to remind you to check out backstory magazine it's my passion project you can find it at backstory.net and i'll be really short about it if you've ever been on the fence about supporting this magazine like that dog barking in the background well i hope you choose that now is the time 
because I want to keep supporting our excellent entertainment writers, our amazing art director, and of course our editors as well. So your support is crucial now more than ever. We've been updating our Oscar issue, issue 41. We put TV shows in there like Better Call Saul, Upload, Tales from the Loop, so we have, and even devs with Alec Garland, so we have amazing content that we're continuing to update with. You could read excerpts on our website. Heck, you could even read the entire full issue on our website for free. Um, there's a free issue, issue 37, so I hope you'll check that out if you're on the fence. But if you do decide to subscribe and support us, you could use coupon code SAVE5 at checkout at Backstory.net, and that'll save you $5 off a subscription, and we would greatly appreciate it. But now, without any further ado, let's get back into our chat with director Dave Wilson about his debut feature film, Bloodshot. You know, you, you had some really big sequences here that I just want to call out for a second. Um, obviously, the, the, the scene in the tunnel with all oh, yeah. this, you know, a flower truck is, is <laughs> overturned. So you have this dust in the air from the flower the whole time. You, you're in this dark tunnel. It's a very long sequence of him attacking you know, a, a bunch of folks. What were the challenges of shooting that? And how long did it take to shoot? Um, it took about, I think we were in there with first unit for maybe three days and then five with second unit. Although I, um, uh, there was like a period of five days where first unit wasn't working. So when I say second unit, it was uh, my DP and I were, were there from first unit the whole time. So let's just say it was eight days. And I think what's challenging about it is, look, it's just an uncomfortable environment. Uh, it's not flour. Um, flour is actually flammable. Um, really? Uh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, especially like, but not like, uh, like when it's in the air, when it's sort of uh, dispersed. Um, it's flammable, so you can't you can't use it. Uh, which like so many people have reminded me of, like you know, so what, what were you using? Oh, uh, we made like the the special effects guys made this sort of like uh, safe <laughs> like powder, safe, that we, safe dust. Yes, um, which is like so you know that's the it just gets everywhere, and you right. we all have to sort of it was good pre preparation for walking around the neighborhood these days, um, but. Uh, it's an uncomfortable environment, but I often find those yield the best sort of visual, uh, sort of uh, uh, the best visuals. Um, and it's just a lot of like reset time, man. It's like what I talk, like you go and then everything has to get blown off and wiped down and the lights like, you know, like cleaned off and everything. So it's just, it's just time. Every time, like every time you want to go again, it's just, so it, it takes a long time to get that process down. But it's, I mean, it's just like, I, I remember we were shooting the camera test sort of the week before principal photography started and there was this like 18 year old kid and he was just like, Oh my God, it looks like a video game. And like, what I love about it is it was just these guys like sweeping through the fog with their laser sights and everything. It's like, th that's sort of their barometer for like, you know, what they consider quality action visuals is and where they spend most of their time like these days, uh, you know, like, you know, there's a, I think I was, we were doing, we did that Love Death Robots series with Netflix. And I think like one of their biggest competitors is, uh, is Fortnite. They lose most of their viewers to, to go, you know, so it's, you know, um, it was a, it's sort of a nice moment watching sort of a more youthful yeah. entertainment thing respond to it that way. Uh, the elevator fight was another big fight sequence that was very complicated. Obviously you have like the elevator fight and winter soldier as like a barometer to, to build on right. for this, but you, you did a fantastic job and there's, you know, robot arms pulling people up, you know, as, as they're extended, you know, exoskeletons and stuff like that. What were some of the challenges of the elevator fight? It's funny that you mentioned Winter Soldier. Like, I know Joe and, and Anthony. Um, and early on, I was sort of talking to them about Bloodshot and, and whatnot. And uh, there's a character in, in the Elder Scrolls spots called the Breton. And Joe told me like they gave that to those those sort of commercials to their stunt team, and they were like, "That's what we want the Winter Soldier to be like," which was I take as a like I, the Winter Soldier is one of my favorite like MCU films. I love that. I'm a big Stan Sebastian fan. But um, they uh, the the it's funny. The elevator was as um, I wanted to shoot so much of it practically, but it just became increasingly cumbersome and slow to do. Like it was a massive set that we built and like, it's just wire work is just slow and it has to be like, cause it has to be safe. 
Um, and we ended up sort of redoing a whole lot of an in post, um, which is funny because I, I, as, as, as comfortable I am with visual effects, like we went so far and beyond in, 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 I wanted to get far more, like, I feel like visual effects succeeds best when there's a large practical photography base. Um, and we ended up doing so much digitally, um, in that elevator scene. Um, and I actually brought a lot of my, uh, the sort of blur previous artists that I've worked with over the years to the end, sort of once we were back, we like a lot of the back end was, uh, was like all conceived after the fact. Um, there's one shot in there. I'm like, there's a nice anecdotal story here. Uh, the, there's this one long shot as they sort of dive down and there's this like continuous, like 45 second shot as we're falling down the elevator that we added with eight weeks to go before the film released. And, uh, it was um, the the sort of trailer had come out and there was and 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 the sort of Sony was excited and they were like we want some more like big like visual effects shots um, they like you know they, and I pitched them that and they were like oh we're not sure about that and I was like all right look I think it's awesome like I'm gonna go through the whole movie and find the money for it and they're like look if you can pay for it yourself you can do whatever you want so I went through cut like little things out here and there. And, and we should have funded that whole shot with eight weeks to go, which like was so satisfying. I remember we were sitting at the premiere and a couple of the focus groups and it gets a big cheer at the end. And it's always nice to know when those things are successful because it was not easy making that happen. You know, for all the planning that you do and you're really good at planning, what was a happy accident? What was something that you were able to seize on as a director that you hadn't planned that, that, that maybe surprised you? Oh, this look. I'd say more than anything, I think those are with your with your cost. I mean, they're you know, guy is fabulous, and I wouldn't even. It's hard to even call them accidents because sure. he arrive, he arrives on the day with like, hey, I know you want to do it like this, but like he's like, what about this? And like, it's that happens a lot. Like, so they're not really accidents. They're that's what I'm saying. You sort of have to leave yourself open to to other people's, you know, and with someone like, like he's fabulous about, you know, there's the script and then the, the, there's his character's interpretation of it. And Guy is just wonderful at sort of finding his own sort of, uh, his own voice for the character. So, so was that it? was it. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go, go on, go on. But no, I'm just saying that was a sort of, like I said, you can't really call that an accident. That's just the sort of nature of, of, right. this, of discovery. I would say, um, Mm, nothing's coming to mind right now. It's been a while. It's been that's that's fine. That's fine. What was the scene that you hated to cut, but you had to for the sake of the movie? And you know, it's always an interesting lesson because, of course, if you had more time to think about it, you probably wouldn't have shot the scene, and then you could have put that money in your budget or that time towards something else. So, what was your your lesson in editing on this? You know, we didn't. There was like there's the scene at the uh, at the very end in that takes place like. After the elevator, they, they used to crash down into this like pool and then Bloodshot and Dalton have this fight and then the nanites um, sort of disable Dalton's exoskeleton and then he ultimately ends up drowning in the pool. I think it may even be on the like deleted scenes or something. And we spent, we spent a couple of days in there and I think while I still love the scene and where it could be, it sort of fractured the end of, of, like, of the film uh, and sort of not killed the momentum, but it sort of it it sort of split up, bifurcated like the the, the confrontations with with Harding and Dalton and, and whatnot. And ultimately, like it just didn't work out as as well as I. I and it's not even that I'm I was initially reluctant to cut it, but we used to have the saying at Blur, like with my previous supervisor, like like you spend so much time obsessing over something and it, it ultimately becomes the boulder that is in the way of you telling the story in the best way possible. And it's hard to get rid of because of all the time and love and sweat equity you put into making that thing. But when you eventually do take the step to remove it, everything else seems to flow smoother now that it's gone. Right. And it's a hard part of the process. And especially it can be aggravated by the fact as a filmmaker, if someone has pointed it out, that it may be the boulder impeding your narrative. And then you've sort of aggressively need when a knee jerk response sort of defend it. Uh, it makes it difficult, more difficult to remove it later, admitting that they were right. But which is why, like, I think it's 
just, you know, um, one of the things I've learned over the years is not to sort of, is to limit the knee jerk responses and to sort of give everything it's, it's time, every opinion it's, uh, let it run its course because you never know where the great idea may be coming from. And ultimately, like, so what I say, I didn't want, like, I didn't want it, uh, I didn't want to lose it. Like, ultimately, it was the right thing for this, for the story. But, okay, so it just, it sped things up. Would you say that, that time was the lesson there? Um, and that's why it was cut? Yes. I, not so much running time, more as, like, uh, you know, in terms of finding the, the most important thread at the time and are we spending our, our time with that or are we just delaying what people want us to get to, I think was what was important to me. I, I forgot to ask earlier, you used the, the song Psycho Killer during oh, yeah. the, the cheesy montage in the beginning and it, and it was like, you know, a song that's played over and over. It has memory recall for him yeah. because it's a planted memory. How difficult right. was it to get the rights to that? And was that always the song that you started with? The very first, uh, Rob Cairns, who does who, comp- who does the music for most of my commercials, um, at, and my and my Love Death Robot short Sunny's Edge. I've known Rob for years. He's a big sort of music. So I called him and I'm like, Rob, I need I need the song. And then we sat down. We talked about the scene, and then he gave me a couple of choices, and we sort of sat. We listened to them together, and then he hit Psycho Killer, and I was like, okay, this is this is perfect. Like not just because like I love the song. But also because it's just like in terms of coloring in the trope of it all, it just sort of fits perfectly. Um, and then, yeah, like it, it was a long process of of talking uh, to, to talking heads and and just making sure it all works. But it wasn't. Um, it ate up my entire like song budget. Let's just put it that way. I had a That's few good. pennies was, left over one side. Uh, one side. It, it was a good spend. Well, so you know, two last questions because I know we're starting to, to run out of time, but. Um, what was your toughest scene as a director? What was the scene that you really sweated coming back to again and again? You weren't sure if it was going to work the day you were directing. And how did you creatively rise to that challenge? Um, I would, so this sort of split into two, like they both have their complications, like action scenes and dramatic scenes. Like the, the scene at the doorway with Gina, like there was definitely that scene and the scene on the fishing pier with Guy, they were like, we were just so pressed for time. Um, that like there was very little time to vet whether I had everything I needed. Um, the fishing pier scene in particular, we had 19 minutes to shoot it. We were meant to have four hours. Um, Wait, and, how did you go from four hours to 19 minutes? What happened? Uh, that is that is a story for an, an, another podcast. Okay, right? okay. Um, and. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't, like, I was on the radio walking to set, talking to my DP, saying, like, telling him, like, the, the camera positions were all changed. I'm, like, I'm, ye- I'm like yelling, like, we got to go there. I get there. I don't even know, like, and I remember getting to the cutting room the next day, the next evening. I'd go to the cutting room every, like, uh, my editor was with us out there. And, uh, and like, Jock had hidden cameras. I didn't even know we were there. So there was all this like B and C footage that I didn't know we'd shot. And I was like, God bless that man for getting that stuff. Because like, I didn't know, like I was just, I was just there with with Vin and guy and saying, I need this. I need, I didn't even have time to run back to the monitors half the time. Like, right. In a short period of time like that, it does make sense to have three cameras rolling. That really would save. Oh, we rolled as many cameras as we could every, every day. Like you learn, like it's also a process of figuring out how your actors like to work and then sort of, trying to accommodate that as best as, as possible. Like, but yes, we were all, uh, we, we, you know, we needed to, we knew we would have to move quickly. So, uh, and we what were, was the challenge with Gina at the doorway? The same thing. It was just um, short on, short on time. And then like, and kids, like uh, kids are tricky. Like they don't seem to follow direction as well as you would like. Um, I'm sure there are wonderful ones out there. Uh, uh, but it was just, it was the same problem. It's like, those are, those are scenes where you really want to sit with it and 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 sort of uh, and discover it and then try something else and then try it. like getting back to the cutting room with options is is a very very valuable thing um, for a director and you know when you when you've just got to keep going because like you have to move that's tough like and especially for dramatic scenes and then on the action side of it. Um, I'm not used to not directing my own action. I've never worked with a second unit before. Like it blur, like we do all our own work. So there was definitely a part of 
of having to let go of, of part of it um, that I that was that was challenging for me just in terms of like a not being able to, to, to you do know I, I would guess I would guess I would liken it to like some of your animation stuff if if you've done your pre-production right you've been involved with every storyboard with your animatics with your proofs of concept oh, for sure for sure and at that point your second yeah. unit is hopefully just if yeah, that's, vision if in that there sense, is reproduction right? for that scene you're shooting. Like, <laughs> there was some things that changed that like there was, we didn't have time to prep it as well as I would have liked. So we kind of just had to go. Um, and and th that is where I was, where we had prepped, like you're saying, I was completely comfortable. But yeah. where it wasn't, and there was a sort of void of to be filled with a, a, a directorial opinion other than my own, I, <laughs> that, that was tough. Well, well, so I guess I guess the last question would be, you know, this this came out right as lockdowns were starting around the nation, yep. and you know, it, it was it, it was it was a crazy time to release a film. But but actually, in film history, Bloodshot will be one of the first films cited as having a very close day and date release of a major studio feature film. It's a practice that obviously has been going on for a long time right. with with independent films. But, uh, you know, could there be a sequel? Like, like I know that, that Bloodshot has gotten views during, during quarantine right now. So have you... Yeah, we did. I, like, I, was, I was surprised, like, like, remarkably so. Like, uh, um, pretty flawed, actually, by how much it has been viewed online. I mean, not, you know, surprisingly, we're all stuck at home and, and it's like a, you know, just released in theorist thing. But, like, it was, it was nice to see it have as successful a run. As far as sequels and everything go, like honestly, like I, I, I'm, I'm proud and I'm glad we made that movie. Like as far, like I feel like those decisions will get made somewhere else without me, and that's fine. And if the conversations happen, I will happily be a part of them. But like I'm super excited about what's coming next, and that's where all my energy is focused right now. And is there anything you could tell us? Yes, about, I think about what you're working on now. It was just I've got about thirty seconds, but I know I know. Just, uh, I'm doing this, um, I'm, like, like I said, authors are my rock stars. And one of my favorites is this author called Daniel Suarez. And he wrote this book called Influx that I absolutely adore. Um, it's all about this the government agency that suppresses technology and decides when we are ready for it or, you know, or not. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm doing that with Sony. Um, now Zach Olkowitz is, is writing for me. I love Zach. He's a very talented writer. And, uh, and I'm doing that with escape artists with Tony Shaw and Todd Black. Um, and then I have this other, it's another Daniel Suarez book, uh, called Delta V, which is the story about the first team that goes out to mine a near earth asteroid. It is, that is where, uh, that's why I'm not sleeping right now. Um, uh, I'm very, very excited about that because it matters a lot to me. I feel like it's meaningful in where we are headed as a species and, and what, where our efforts and, and so perfect. did you get the rights to that book personally and you're, you're adapting? Dan and I are good friends and I came back from Bloodshot and I, I, we have been trying to make this other books called Demon and Freedom. We've been trying to adapt them for years and I came back from Bloodshot and I was like, Dan, I want, let's get back to Demon. And he, and he was like, nope. And he dumped the manuscript for Delta V on me. He was like, I want to do this. And I read it like that weekend and I was like, we have to make this. And, uh, and that's where we are. Cool, man. Well, I can't wait to see what you do next. You, thank you for being so generous with your time. And uh, hopefully the next time we're having one of these chats, we're in front of a live audience at a screening. Well, that would be good. Good yeah, chat, thanks, my friend. Bye. Bye. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to director Dave Wilson for stopping by to chat about his debut feature film, Bloodshot, which I hope you'll check out on VOD because it's part of that historical experiment where films from theaters are now opening on VOD a lot faster and sooner. And Dave's was one of the first. And while you're surfing around online, I hope you'll stop by Backstory.net to check out my passion project, Backstory Magazine. And I just wanted to remind you that in case you're interested in subscribing, you could use code SAVE5, which will get you $5 off a one-year subscription if you use it at Backstory.net. There's a lot of great content there. You could read an entire issue for free, so I hope you check it out. Look, your support means everything to us, so thanks for considering. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2020, all rights reserved. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.